Yeah. <laughs> this meeting is being recorded. Okay. So we're just going to wait a minute for people to join us. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Going to wait a minute and then start. Okay. Just making sure everyone can see my screen. Yeah. Okay. Should we get started? Great. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first event for the GCC Silicon Valley Founder Institute semester. We're so excited to be kicking off this semester with you all. And of course, one of the most exciting events that we always have a lineup is the pitch event. So this event is called Pitch Your Startup Idea to GCC investors and experts. And we do have an interesting lineup for you. And I'm sure that you will get a lot of value, whether you are pitching tonight or you're just in attendance. Just to give you kind of a quick rundown of what you'll be in for today, I'm just going to do a very quick introduction about Founder Institute for those that are not familiar with it yet. And then uh, we'll have our mentors introduce themselves. We'll give you some ideas and tips about the pitching best practices, and then we're going to go to the pitches. We are hoping to fit in at least five or six pitches today over approximately 45 minutes, and then we can still have about 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers so you can get the best value out of it. And of course, we invite you to stick around and um, join us in the Air Meet, and that's our networking opportunity virtually. But this is going to be a link that um, my uh, colleague Carmen will be posting in the messages. So just to give you to know who's here today from Founder Institute, uh, myself, I'm Dr. Hanan Al-Basha. I'm the co-director of the semester, along with my colleagues, of course, Samir Sorter, who's the director of the GCC and UAE, and Carmen Matias, and she is also the co-director of the GCC chapter. For those who are not aware of Founder Institute, Founder Institute has been founded in 2009 and is currently the world's largest pre-seed accelerator program coming out of Silicon Valley. It is the number, place, number one place in the world to turn your ideas into fundable startups and global businesses. Global startups is a concept and global entrepreneurship are definitely concepts that are interwoven. And that is because at this point in time, there are over 5,300 um, graduates from as in and institutes and graduates out of Founder Institute program with a total value of approximately $1.5 billion that have just been raised from the investors. The total value, sorry, of the portfolio is up, well, exceeding now $25 billion. You would have heard of some of the very interesting names such as Udemy and others from this portfolio. We are present in over 90 countries and over 200 cities, 25,000 mentors and uh, advisors and investors are included, including the 22,500 investors, Today, you're meeting at least three, four, five of the, the partners, and some of them are investors from just the program of Founder Institute. So it is an expansive network. It is an opportunity for you to get immersed in a network that just gives you global access at your fingertips. But of course, what does Founder Institute stand for? We believe that there are great entrepreneurs everywhere. And it's just a matter that they need to be equipped and empowered with the knowledge and with the networks to be able to impact the world. The Founder Institute is very um, concerned uh, that the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN need to be upheld and that every one of us could make an impact, a positive impact in your own community and in the world at large. The accelerators are now helping the entrepreneurs in the pre-seed, but also once you do get that label, that very proud label of um, graduates from the Founder Institute, you also get, have access to VC Lab 
and to other um, networks and other programs that are there for life. So this is something to aspire for. Um, I'd like to just uh, take a minute here to ask Samir to kind of share with us a few of the success stories within the GCC area of um, Founder Institute graduates. Samir? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Anand, and, and uh, welcome to all the uh, investors on board here today. Um, and, and we have some amazing uh, content going forward. Um, just to kind of give you a heads up, uh, Founder Institute, uh, uh, you know, very proud uh, that I was uh, given the opportunity to launch Founder Institute in September 2020, where we started our first cohort in Dubai, uh, consolidated our position strongly in Dubai, Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And then slowly we we're expanding across the GCC region. Um, we have run five cohorts so far, uh, and those include four in the UAE. And, and when I mean the cohorts in the UAE, actually we have founders from over 17 countries applying because it's a virtual accelerator program. And one program we've run in Saudi with some fantastic founders who've graduated. So total, we have about 22 graduate companies, as we say, graduates or graduate companies who have, uh, you know, with all dedication and sincerity and honesty, followed the FI company development process and have really found traction. Five of the companies have also raised investment with an average ticket size of $250,000. And I'm very proud to say that since uh, Sunday and today, we have two companies out of the 22 graduates who have found their place in a, in a top 2% uh, of the five and a half thousand portfolio companies of FI called FI, portf FI Select Portfolio. And, and which is just amazing, shows the kind of founders from this region building global companies, right? So um, here we are and, and we are here to kind of create that lifelong learning opportunity for you to become successful founders having a very strong network um, in the UAE and the GCC region. Um, any questions or any comments, feel free to follow us on social. Um, me, Hanan, Carmen, and all of the team are available for um, any responses or answers as, as we will see you in the AirMeet networking room post the session. Handing it over back to you, Carmen. Thank you, Samir. So we'll just resume our presentation really quickly, guys. I would just like to note, as Carmen is preparing you for the pitching opportunities, we know that um, a good number of you have submitted requests to pitch. Make sure, please, that you change your name, um, the display name that you have now as an attendee, to the same name that you requested to pitch with, so we can recognize you and bring you up from the crowd. Okay, so. Um, just to quickly resume our presentation here, just sorry, let me share my screen again. Okay, so now we know what uh, the, the belief system of Founder Institute and what we're trying to do. Um, just to give you a heads up, this is, as I said, this is the first event for our um, semester and our upcoming events. And please do follow us so you know the upcoming events. We have the Women Founder Roundtable coming up on April 19th. Meet the GCC and Silicon Valley Startup Ecosystem Accelerators and Investors coming up on the 10th of May. And Cracking the Code, a very special session with Nader Sabri, who's a NASA certified growth hacker. That's coming up on the 24th of May. The semester itself is going to be running from June 14th until September 20th. That is 14 weeks, and that is the core accelerator program. Always runs for 14 weeks for Founder Institute. This is the link, fi.co slash apply slash GCC. This is where you'll find further information and where you can submit your applications. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our three speakers. We are waiting on Walid to join us, but for now, uh, Wes is the co-founder and CEO of um, Tahseen Consulting. Yasheen Mohaber, he's the chief of staff and head of the special projects with Qatar 
uh, Free Zone Authority, and Walid Bashir is the CEO and founder of Intuity, Intuitu uh, <laughs> Ventures. So Wiss, I'd like to, to ask you please to introduce yourself and just give people uh, kind of a background of who you are and what you do. Hello, everybody. My name is Wes Boyer. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. Um, I am the co-founder of a company called Tassin Consulting. We've been in business since 2012. Um, we do a lot of things, but um, of uh, pertinence to this uh, conversation is we are specialists in technology policy. We help some of the uh, most valuable technology companies in the world uh, navigate the region, influence policies, uh, and uh, uh, and change policies uh, across their region. We focus on a very broad uh, swath of countries from Mauritania through to Pakistan uh, and also Southeast Asia and India. Um, my area of specialty is supporting startups in unregulated spaces, highly regulated spaces, and uh, spaces where there's absolutely no uh, regulatory precedent. Uh, I am also uh, a very active angel investor, and I typically invest uh, normally in you know one to two deals uh, per month. Um, my focus tends to be emerging and frontier markets, uh, and, and particularly opportunities where there's a, a ecosystem convergence play with the uh, MENA. So I like to look at India, Southeast Asia, Africa, LATAM, and, and uh, many places in between. Um, and that's it. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much, Wes. And uh, as um, as I'd like to say, as aspiring founders or aspiring entrepreneurs, what you want to do is always keep the ear out and the connections to be able to realize who can be part of your support system. As Wes said, um, his interests are varied, and that this is the kind of thing that this this is the kind of environment, as we said, within Founder Institute that you want to be embedded in. Um, Yashin, can you introduce yourself, please, for us today? Hi everyone, you can just call me Yash, it's easier. Yes. Um, I'm a former, <laughs> former investment banker, moved to strategy consultant for McKinsey, where I specialized in helping set up kind of in, kind of ecosystems around entrepreneurship and building companies for like how countries think about it. Um, following that, I moved to Qatar, where I was um, kind of, I helped companies set up their uh, large, small, everything. Um, but largely I'm a founder at heart. I've done startups since I was like, I think 21. Uh, I've had five failures and three muddle along the way and two that I've exited quite successfully. Um, I do a lot of my, my stuff in Africa. So where it's most hard, uh, marketplaces, delivery apps, all of these type of things are kind of set up from the ground up. So I've been through the journey that most of you guys will go through and I'd love to give you insights from there. Uh, lastly, as well, since I've been lucky enough to kind of generate a tiny bit of capital, I don't as invest as frequently as West does, but one or two opportunities a year I like to throw my hand in, especially if I can get involved and help scale the company. Yeah, that's me. Great. Thank you, Ash. Another investor, another potential investor on board right now. Walid, you joined us in perfect timing. Thank you so much for being with us and would love for you to introduce yourself to everyone. Hi, uh, thanks Hanan and thanks everybody, Wes, Samir, and Yasin, and uh, uh, Carmen. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Walid Al Bashir. I'm a tech entrepreneur, uh, 26 years in uh, industry. Uh, I work on earlier days in e government uh, in UAE, uh, 1999. And then from 2004, I start venturing uh, part time. And then by 2007, I, uh, I start creating a couple of companies, almost about six companies. Uh, we, uh, we managed to create the first hosting company back in 2004 and first FinTech in 2006, uh, Sport Tech in 2007, and School and Office Supply in 2013. So um, since 2011, I also started a mobility technology venture in uh, Dubai which is running till today. Um, and uh, we're serving uh, or we're helping clients, you know, uh, with uh, moving boxes and moving people. Out of that in 2018, I created a venture studio in uh, Estonia, um, targeting, um, you know, um, logistic and mobility industry and supporting, you know, uh, clients and founders uh, bringing venture into these industries. And uh, in 2021, I, I was glad to join uh, the VC Lab uh, cohort four and launch my venture fund out of there. 
So we are a five million um, dollar <coughs> studio uh, targeting to support um, uh, mobility and logistic uh, ventures and looking forward to support uh, around 30 ventures in the next four years. Thank you so much, Walid. That's very impressive. And that is another thing of the verticals that we keep talking about, the specialized um, funds coming up to support a vertical in terms of the industry. Thank you, Walid. So you're going to get a very exciting array of feedback today. So just so you know, when you do get the chance today to pitch, these are some guidelines of what you should be pitching. So you get the best feedback possible or the most valuable feedback possible from our um, mentors over here. Your company, my company is, and is developing, what is your defined offering to help? Who is your defined audience? What kind of problem are you solving? And what's your secret sauce? What's making you unique? What's your unique value proposition or unique selling proposition? From that perspective, be as clear as you can so you can get the best value possible. What are our um, pitch or mentors looking for? They will be coming back to you. You have three minutes to pitch and they will come back to you maximum within a minute each to tell you whether they're assessing you or they're giving you feedback on the pitch itself in terms of its clarity, presentation and content, and in terms of the idea as well, the business idea validity, the potential and the risks. So please use this opportunity and utilize every, write down everything you're gonna get because this is very important and we know how it is just to be able to move forward with it. Um, last reminder, please, that we do have uh, an after event networking on AirMeet, and you will find the link to that uh, spot or that virtual space for us in the chat. Uh, the Carmen will be posting all the links for you. So without further ado, we can start with our first pitch, and that is Faisal. Faisal, are you with us here today? Okay, did we get Faisal on the stage? Let's get Faisal on the stage. Uh, there we go, Faisal. Okay. So we have Faisal and just so you know, no, Abdurrahman Badir, please get ready after Faisal, that will be your turn. Faisal, you have the option to be able to share your screen, please go ahead. You have three minutes. Faisal, are you ready? Faisal, you're on mute. Let's hear you. Can we hear you? Hello? Yes, we can yeah, hear I you can... now. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. You've got three my... minutes. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Faisal Guraya. Uh, I am uh, co founder of Balkistan. Uh, Balkistan is a virtual sales force for small scale manufacturers. Manufacturers contributing 25% in the exports of Pakistan, 78% in the industrial environment. Manufacturers making incredible products. These manufacturers were there when Game of Thrones were produced, their products were used in that series as well. These manufacturers uh, face immense problem in the existing B2B process, uh, problems such as the price visibility, bias data, and payment. These manufacturers totally rely on wholesale, and interestingly, the buyer also rely on the wholesale. The market is too big. It's a $90 billion market. More than six lakh manufacturers are working in Pakistan, making export quality products. Uh, uh, the China Economic Pakistan Corridor is also open, and the recent re rising labor and production costs in our neighbor countries make a solid case for the 10x growth in the manufacturing and trading industry in Pakistan. Our launch point is the printing and packaging industry. It's a $6.5 billion industry uh, with more than 50,000 manufacturers and 8 lakh buyers being present in Pakistan. Our revenue model is simple. We charge commission and subscription. Uh, we offer a wide range of variety and services to our sellers and buyers to increase their productivity and also their profitability. Great. Since our launch, uh, we have uh, raised three like fifty thousand dollars on safe notes from friends and family, and so far we have generated seven lakh worth of GMV and twenty five hundred orders. 
over month on month gav growth rate over month on month gav growth rate is 28% with the drop size or bucket size growing at the rate of 75% it's a b2b market so their drop size will keep increasing so far we have raised three, like $50000 and we are raising 1 million dollars more to scale our platform and onboard buyers and sellers to interact with each other with the money we can easily capture premium 500 5000 buyers and 1500 manufacturers with these manufacturer we can easily reach 10 millions of gmv in a month because these are the manufacturer which are making best in quality products in pakistan and they are also exporting their products through intermediaries why we think we can do this because we are from the industry we have worked with this with these traditional businesses uh, in our corporate life and we understand what they need and what they want we are here to promote pakistani manufacturers uh, we are their online sales channel partner that's uh, the concise version of pakistan i would love to hear from the industry expert about the business and the pitch yeah Thank you, Faisal. So that was yeah. exactly three minutes. So thank yeah. you for that. Uh, Wiz would like to go to you first. What's your feedback for Faisal, please? I mean, I would have liked to have seen sort of like what the manufacturing base looks like in, in Pakistan and particularly export-oriented manufacturers. I mean, I know Pakistan to be an exporter of agriculture, for example, but I don't know precisely, you know, what role it plays in, in the paper and packaging sector. Yeah. I think yeah. also, um, in relation to paper and packaging, and, and you're, you mentioned China, there's a very big shortage of paper uh, right now in the world that's, you know, sort of compounded with supply chain uh, challenges. And, and a lot of industries are sort of struggling with, with uh, input costs going up quite yeah. a bit. And I think probably you need to address that if that's sort of your, you know, part of your go-to-market go uh, strategy and, and acquiring initial, um, uh, you know, uh, businesses and manufacturers on that side. And I think, you know, possibly there's some opportunities there in, in, in that um, uh, issue in particular, because I, I'm guessing that Pakistan sits more on the raw material side. And so thus it can sort of solve you know, let's say solve some of those paper shortages. Yeah, uh, like uh, in printing and packaging industry, uh, it's not only about papers, it's also about plastic, but it's also on the verge of shortages as well. Uh, why we launched printing and packaging industry? Because it's the most easiest industry to capture. And my career started from this industry in 2008. I was a salesman and I started working as a, a restaurant order booker. Uh, for a company. Uh, yeah, Mata. I think definitely would help to, so, to sort of clarify yeah, that. Uh, to, answer, uh, to answer your question, Pakistan is being famous for surgical tools for export, textile, uh, leather products, uh, and there are hello? a lot of raw material, agriculture based. But uh, in finished goods, we are uh, pretty, uh, exporting leather products, uh, surgical products. Uh, our uh, price, in price comparison, we are quite cheaper than China and India as well. In surgical uh, uh, category. Faisal, Faisal uh, yeah. I'm going to cut you off there, please. You oh, had the opportunity oh. to pitch. Now you have to wait and listen to the feedback. Oh, okay. That you oh, okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. No sorry. problem. Wes, do you have anything else to add for Faisal here? Wes, can you hear me? Okay. Wes, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, okay. uh, my, no. my earphones is cocked out. No problem. I was just asking, do you have anything further to add to Faisal here? Faisal, I'd just say that uh, if, if you uh, change that, I think it would enhance, enhance the presentation and then also you know, to, uh, include the, the major export markets. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Wes. Yash? Hey, guys. Uh, Faisal, uh, so let me split it out into kind of the presentation and then the idea, right? So and I love this idea, by the way. Um, from the presentation side, uh, you you told us too much, right? Like uh, this is a, the presentation you have is a 10 minute to 15 minute discussion. You need a three to four pager, right? Focus on what your key message to uh, come across and nail those key messages. Like you said a lot of good stuff, but it kind of got diluted along the way, right? Um, okay. 
second thing, just to revalidate your numbers. You're saying things like, oh, we're going to get 10 to 50% commission, but then your GMV to revenue line item is 5%, right? So like in, intuitively investors pick up on these small things and then it makes sense that, oh, when you guys were starting, you didn't really get that, right? Um, the third thing is you really need to crack a page on the model, right? The fundamental for your business case, and I need to see how you're going to get the two sides of the market, how you're going to get manufacturers and how you're going to get salespeople for them, right? Um, and that's what didn't come across very clearly. You told the kind of story of if, if you had the salespeople and if you had the manufacturers, this is what would, would achieve, but not how you're going to get the salespeople and how you're going to get the manufacturers on, right? Um, right. On the idea itself, which I love, and you must remind me, I'll, I need to put you in touch with Hamza at Bazaar. Uh, he's the ex colleague of mine, right? I think Jock can figure out some great thing to work together. Um, sure. I think you did it well by saying, look, you're going to focus on paper, right? But sure. make it tangible. Say, like, it's a piece of paper or pens or stationery and visualize it and say, this is the salespeople that how it's going to work, who they're going to sell to. Uh, this is the thing that they're going to sell. This is how the manufacturer makes money versus these differently. So break it down. The traditional model is manufacturer to wholesaler, wholesaler to end user, right? Now you go uh, manufacturer, your platform to sales guy to end user. And you need to say what, what's the difference between them, right? Because from a manufacturer's point of view, a wholesaler is much easier to deal with. I have a contract with the guy. I deliver consistently with sales guys. I can't predict volume. These guys are running around. How they incentivize all of these things are questions that would pop up, right? Um, and you just need to think about that type of thing. I, by the way, I'm super supportive of this idea. I, I, I love it, yeah. right? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Second yeah. one thing, one small thing to just add is the sales guys are your, are your sales pitch, right? That's what you right. have, your yeah. actual content to the sales guys. You need to say, what are you going to do with that? Right? How do you uh, educate them? How do you make them effective? What tools do you give them? How, what is the difference from me randomly hiring a real estate agent to do this because he sells houses, he can sell stationery hmm. versus what you hmm. guys will be giving them, right? They trust hmm. salespeople to communicate their product across effectively. How do you build that trust? Yeah, that's it for me. Otherwise, uh, great you. job, Faisal. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Walid, do you yeah, have any feedback? I think, uh, I, idea, idea is very valid. Um, it, it really fits uh, perfectly, you know, in what's going on today within the supply chain um, uh, in, industry. Uh, I do agree with Yash and, and, and Wes and a couple of his staff. Um, the, the, there's, uh, there's loads of information in the, in the pitch, but I think um, you, you need to get some of the messages clear first, and then you can recap on whatever else. First, what is the problem you're trying to solve? The second, what is the solution like? And emphasize on the value proposition, uh, particularly. I'm in the industry. I, 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 I did not get clearly the value proposition you, 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 you try to, to offer to your customer. Uh, the, then after that, number three is like, why you? And, and comes here the competitive advantage and the market and, and, and your positioning and what you and all and and, 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 your, and your experience as founders and stuff and then business model so four thing problem solution why you and business model uh, if you get this clear then uh, at least you could uh, um, inject more information into that um, my question would be what is the exact value proposition that you're offering to your clients uh and and and, and um, regarding the business model is clear you're doing subscription you're doing bear, bear whatever are you doing mid mile are you doing uh, last mile are, are you doing marketplace what what, what what is the nature of your uh, of your uh, startup okay thank you also Faisal, show your face yes Great. exactly i was just about to say that last comment before Faisal, before thanking you you're pitching, you need to make sure that you are pitch ready and pitch ready means also yeah. that you're on camera and you're camera ready, okay? Yeah, I was, Thank uh, you. Uh, I, I, uh, it, it, uh, my number came first, so I didn't know how to turn off the video because I had to complete <laughs> no the uh, presentation in three minutes, that's why. No problem, that's for everyone. Just, uh, just a note for everyone, when you're pitching, make sure you're camera ready, 
your lighting yeah. is right, your technology yeah. is all right. Thank you, Faisal, for being with yeah. us tonight. I'm gonna move you so back much. to, thank you. Okay, so um, now Nihal, Nihal is up. Hi, Nihal. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, all you've right. got three Let minutes. share my screen. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Thanks for thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Nihal. Uh, I am the founder and uh, the CEO of Mainaflow. Uh, we are uh, building a marketing automation tool for the Middle East. Uh, so we focus concentrate on the one million plus SMEs uh, in the region. Uh, why? Because uh, first thing is uh, a lot of because because of COVID and the induction and the explosion that happened because of it. Uh, both the supply and the demand increased uh, uh, almost overnight uh, for online uh, requirement. Uh, so you you might have seen that in fintech and creator economy, entrepreneurial economy, and things like that. Uh, what we've seen is uh, in the last one year alone, uh, we we've been able to track seventy thousand plus businesses who've come online from an offline environment or have created a website. So this is but just in the GCC region. Uh, and with that, a lot of platforms came into play, uh, which help businesses create an e-commerce store, an online store, an online website. So uh, what we are trying to do is, you know, uh, we're trying to address one particular pillar uh, in the e-commerce stack, that's marketing, while others are focusing on logistics, fulfillment, storefront requirement, things like that. Uh, the problem that we're trying to solve is uh, with respect to uh, how people are, how uh, as an e-commerce business owner, you're spending a lot of money uh, getting people to your website, but a lot of them are not going to buy from you. Uh, and our solution is uh, is to help you uh, win back your customers, win back your visitors, right? So, uh, uh, so what we do is we track all the uh, visitors that come to your website uh, by their email, by their uh, uh, SMS, uh, by the phone numbers and things like that and then allow you to reach out to them using our pre-built templates so that you can get them back to your website and possibly complete that, make them complete the order, right? So uh, yeah, so again, uh, reiterating that we are the first and the only uh, e-commerce focused uh, automated marketing platform uh, for in the region. We support Arabic, our uh, team is, uh, our, our primary uh, focus is on Arab customers. Uh, and in the Saudi uh, initially. So what we are seeing is uh, with the initial uh, users, we are seeing an uplift of 133% uh, in first time purchases and a 23% uh, cart recovery. So people who come, uh, so this, this, is, this is going to impact your revenue. So you're going to uh, get 20 to 30% more uh, purchases happening. Uh, globally, we, these are the biggest competitors. Clearview is uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, competitors or you know we are like them they focus on e-commerce but for shopify users so shopify has a 5 million plus uh data place and clavio is 90 percent dependent on shopify Michael, and your are... time is up right so uh just taking through through the uh founders so we've been working for the last 10 years in the ecosystem and uh, one of our advisors is uh, sali who's uh from uh one of the ecosystem providers in the market okay, thank so thanks, you thanks Michael. Yeah, Thank so. you. Um, Yash, let me start with you today. Today, now, I mean, <laughs> with, uh, with feedback to Nihal. Yeah, so uh, clear presentation uh, in, okay, let me do presentation idea, right? So clear presentation, I think you covered the main points. There was one slide, uh, probably two slides missing. Okay, one you just <laughs> showed. <laughs> <laughs> that I was going to ask about the pricing and how does it work. Uh, the second one is uh, who your typical customer is. You kind of glossed over it a bit, but you really need to say, is it the kind of Shopify D2C kind of guys, which I think you're targeting, or is it someone who's doing like a two-sided marketplace, that type of thing, right? You need to be very clear on who your target customer is. On the business model itself, you are going into a super tough and competitive space, right? Um, you're going into the space where people either can think they can do it themselves or there's some model that's getting pushed on them 
directly like Shopify saying, I'll assist you with improving your marketing. Google itself saying, I'll help you. Facebook itself saying, it'll help you. You need to come across, those are your typical main competitors in terms of converting them from whatever they're doing by themselves to how you can assist them better they, than they can, right? Because you're operating between the do-it-yourself and the kind of agency model, right? Um, the last thing that wasn't too clear for me is, and you said it, but hey, uh, you guys are Arabic, right? That was the only differentiator that I caught and maybe I missed something along the way. M maybe that is something that can be overlapped very quickly. You need to think yeah, about so, what- so Let me just, uh, uh, I mean, I think both the questions can be answered with uh, uh, the target market itself. We don't, yeah. uh, so in the region, it's not Shopify. The platforms are Salla and Makan and Zid and many other platforms. These, these support almost 70 to 80,000. They want to reach 500,000 businesses by 2025, right? So and, well, we focus on these I platforms. I have platform in the region, right? Yeah, so Shopify does not have much much of a presence here at all. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, but then you're supporting those like models, right? Right, right. That yeah, is yeah. probably isn't clear. Okay, that's it from me. Otherwise, uh, good presentation. Thank you, Yash. Thank you. Thanks, you thanks Yash. Um, no, I think uh, I think if you if you main value proposition is like helping them with call for action. I don't know. You correct me uh, if I'm wrong. Are you helping them with call for action, or uh, or what are you particularly helping those uh, sell and others with? So, so, so uh, we are uh, getting, so Sala is one of our partners that we work with. Uh, they help businesses create a website. We help the same businesses get more orders, right? So Sala is, has its own app store and we are one of the bigger, um, uh, if you go to their marketing uh, category, we are the uh, only people who are providing a marketing product to them. Okay, so, so what, what what if I come to to Yash in um, uh, to Yash um, uh, comments again? What if Salah and those others they extended their offering to what you're offering? Then what, what would you uh, what would be your position at it's, that time? So Salah is trying to build a Shopify kind of an ecosystem. So uh, we are not dependent on Salah for our marketing or support. We do our own marketing. We just are an app that exists inside that ecosystem. So it's an open API. Right, so uh, if they are going to sub stop support, then they have to stop support for everyone. Right, so it's a platform that they're trying to build, like Google Play Store, or you know, Google can even can come and say they can they'll they'll build apps for every category, but it's definitely not uh, advisable. Right. So, so have you have you, you have you validated have you validated this hypothesis? I mean, uh, your your features today, the couple of hypotheses. Uh, have you validated those hypotheses? Uh, in terms of uh, barrier to entry or in terms of, you know, um, uh, your, your positioning in the market itself. Uh, because again, relying on somebody uh, who, who, who could do the service itself or, or, or try relying on their ecosystem, I think uh, on the long run, uh, this could be, you, you see most of the industries now, they are moving into each other, careening to get in into delivery, into vaccination, into home service, you know, and other stuff. So it's very common. For 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 some of the of the ventures to extend okay. their stuff, I think this is an area you need to look at. Uh, uh, do you know about Mobilizer in uh, in uh, in uh, in Saudi? Uh, no. There's another there's a company called Mobilizer, which is mm -hmm. trying to help you know uh, those uh, small vendors who does not have the capability to digitally transform. They're trying to help them reach out the market rather than you know. Uh, just focusing on a specific segment. Uh, uh, this is the area which I, I, I would comment and I would, uh, I would uh, advise you to seek more validation on, uh, on this area. Sure, sure. Thank you, Wally. Thank you, thank you. Wes, do you have feedback for Nihal? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, this is a great uh, problem to be solving. Um, you know, performance growth marketing, retargeting, you know, if you look at any uh, developing a frontier, uh, ecosystem, their, their key uh, sort of skill shortages. I would say there, there's one uh, very big blind spot and, uh, that you didn't mention and you're sort of underestimating, which is competition from India, right? So, so there are two companies you didn't mention. One is Zeno and the other is WebEngage, both 
uh, WebEngage does Arabic, by the way. Um, and both are very well funded with, you know, uh, star uh, cap tables. I think WebEngage has uh, social capital on the cap table, in mm -hmm. fact. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I Yes, you know, I, I, I think effectively they're the, they're the same product, right? And you're telling me that differentiator is Arabic, which I buy. I look, I mean, I, you know, all, my, all of my business partners uh, cry about the, the level of Arabic every single day, right? Uh, and, and so that's obviously a pain point. And to, to focus in particular on that, I, I think would, you know, really d uh, distinguish you from, from that Indian competition. The, the problem for, for an investor uh, like me or, 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 or somebody who would be looking more at the D2C lens is that the market size in India is far bigger than the entire MENA. Um, so my, my preference would be to, to invest in, in the Indian variant of this rather than the, the uh, MENA focused one, to be very honest with you. Yeah, just to quickly point out that WebEngage is more of an enterprise focused product uh, and they are not built for SMEs. So we target the SME market uh, and particularly in the e-commerce section. So WebEngage, I've used WebEngage. I've used it for the last five years. I've worked in growth marketing uh, forever. So CleverX, WebEngage, MoEngage, these are the biggest uh, players in the mobile app marketing uh, 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 in, 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 in section of marketing automation. So, so uh, I, I understand what you, where you're coming from. There are hundreds of tools out there in the global ecosystem. Anybody can get into the Middle East. Uh, we just want to be specialized with the channels that the Arab or the Middle Eastern market needs and the languages support and the, and the technologies that they are using. So our that's, integration- That's right. Thank you. This is a good yeah. premise, but the, the, obviously the exit opportunity from, from that type of focus is limited then, right? from an investor perspective. Right, right, right. Thank you, Nihal. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, good luck with your idea. And hopefully Thank we'll you. see you within the Finance Institute much. program to further solidify your offering. Gotcha. We have you, Joe, man. Joe DeRosa. Hi, Joe. Wait, hang on. There we go. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, great. You ready? Thanks for having me, guys. No problem. You've um, got three minutes. You can go ahead now. Okay. Hold on one second here. Can you guys see this? Nope. I see a uh, black screen. Let's see if it pops up here. Nothing yet? No. <laughs> What's going on here? Um, I stop sharing and share again. Yeah, I guess. Hold on. Uh, let me try to open it first. All right. And then let's go zoom and try to share. How about now? Any good? No. No. Would you would you like so you don't so you don't lose the opportunity? Would you still like to yeah, go okay. through Let your idea without the screen? Real quick here. Okay, then uh, just stop the screen sharing and you've got three minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, essentially, um, I am, my name is Joe DeRosa. Um, I've been involved in a couple different uh, startups. I uh, ran and published the New York Artist Series for a number of years. I've had a real estate license uh, for over 20 years, and I have a mortgage license as well. Uh, I am in Southern California. My company is called Seedlings. Uh, we are um, basically looking to help solve the co-living issue or to help solve the housing issue through co-living, residential co-living in Southern California. Uh, we're taking a new approach. Uh, essentially, um, commercial real estate is usually defined by revenue and valued in such a way where the single family home market is basically determined by a one to two person income and what can be afforded. Uh, we're looking to take advantage of the gaps in those properties and maximize revenue in those areas uh, by uh, co-living each room out. Uh, it's a managed, professionally managed roommate situation. Uh, we're a different approach. We're taking an ownership approach where we're actually buying the properties. Um, 
let's see here. It's a huge market. It's a half trillion market, uh, dollar trillion dollar market. Uh, there's 19.2 million college students here in um, the United States alone each year. So it's a refreshing market. We think we can get the lifetime value of each customer um, up over $100,000 by providing real estate mortgage services when they decide to stop co-living um, and sort of hook the young adults and transition them into buying their first home. And that'll be one, and eventually into, you know, um, rental properties um, and manage, helping them manage those. So, you know, it could be a lifetime proposition for them. Um, that's basically what I have for you since it's only three minutes and I took up a couple of minutes with the screen share. It's okay. Thank you, Joe. I'm Will happy to answer any you. questions and, you know, I have a data room set up. Um, so, you know, I've been eyeballing about uh, seven houses here. It's a $2 million ask for a 10% post. Um, we are, I'm eyeballing a bunch of properties here where I think would be effective. So we're pretty much ready to go. I've been monitoring the real estate. I've been working on this for a year, getting the proper licensing in Southern California as a realtor and uh, a mortgage loan officer since I just moved down here. And, um, and I have all that licensing. So we can operate as both of those um, without the company having the expense of running both a mortgage and a real estate company. So we can gain the financial benefits. That's how Thank I've you. positioned the startup. Thank you, Joe. Wally, do you have feedback for Joe? Well, I think I think the Joe, the, the problem we're trying to solve, it's uh, it's it's a media problem, especially the post pandemic, you know? Yeah. And then helping those um, um, uh, yeah, you know uh, owners uh, get in uh, with, with their uh, uh, with their expenses and stuff like that. That's uh, that's a very important uh, part. Uh, the way to do it, maybe if we could see the presentation, we we could have some more visual to to understand. But again, related to Airbnb and others, uh, how how do how do you see yourself among um, among this? And what what sort of uh, uh, why now? If I ask you why now, uh, how, how, how would you answer that? Uh, I would answer two questions. I mean, look, you gave me two questions. How, how do I see myself versus Airbnb? I see seedlings as the Airbnb version of um, the managed co-living, professionally managed co-living residential. So, you know, if you have a college student and you're sending them to one of the colleges, uh, you can hop on here. You're going to see an apartment, do a virtual walkthrough. Um, you're going to be able to sign a lease if you want to with whether you've seen it or not. Or um, we will have realtors in each state. So we'll be banging the law there. So we'll be able to offer real estate services as well to these people when they decide to leave our system um, and then try and sell them on, you know, real estate investment and, you know, maximum buying uh, investment properties through co-living, sort of like Airbnb does. They have a whole sort of investment team that helps their clients buy more properties and become more invested in their company. So you, you're, uh, targeting manage, you, you're targeting manage, ma, 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 manage uh, living, you know? So it's a, it's right. a little bit premium service done than, than, than a sort of service that is done by, you know, by, by a husband and a wife or, or you know, by, uh, right. by an owner of a property. And, you know, we know the law, so they can't tell you you can't have people in there after nine o'clock. You know, people, kids don't want to have their landlords living on top of them. So to have a company they can call when they have a roommate situation is much better than, you know, having your roommate there. If you guys want to have a couple of beers on a Tuesday night and you know your landlord's looking at you funny. So they don't want to be in that kind of environment. Clear, clear, clear enough. Yeah. You know, they they perform. They prefer the managed system. Thank Make you. them feel more like we are in Dubai. We, we are in Dubai and now manage um, uh, ma, 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 manage short rental, if you may, may, may call it, or even longer rental. It's a big trend right now. There's some uh, recent regulation that allowed this based on a specific structure. It was not allowed uh, unless for uh, high premium properties with specific license. So I think yeah, it's um, uh, it's filling uh, some uh, some big gap in the market. Oh, globally, it's huge. You know, there's tons of consolidation, tons of buyout. Common is one of the bigger ones in the United States. Bungalow, they very are, are really fluttering, though, and they don't really understand the market. Now, let me answer the second question you had is why now? Um, Joe, make it brief, please, because we oh, still yeah. have um, Wissan Yash 
still to give okay. you feedback. Just so, a real no. quick on the why now. Um, as you saw with WeWork, there's a lot of investment money that likes to go into real estate because it's really safe. Um, I noticed looking at Common and Bungalow that that money hasn't been going into the residential market like it should. Um, so there's about a trillion dollars worth of private equity and investment money that could still come into this area. Um, and they're not doing it because they don't know the law and they don't understand the real estate practice and they're not focusing on the lifetime value of services that they could provide their customers. They're taking their 10% management fee from a whole bunch of people. They have no quality of service. They're providing no exit real estate service to their customers as they're leaving, and they're not taking advantage. You've maximized the rental income that you can bring in in residential real estate, and they're not taking advantage of it. They're just selling it to other people. Clear, clear. And private Thank equity you. companies, that's not somebody with any real estate experience would ever do. So there's a lot of money that could be put into this market. Okay. Thank you, Walid. Wes, do you have something to um, a value you can add to Joe here, please? Yeah, Joe, I've worked a lot on home sharing regulations and the sharing economy uh, in general and some of the companies that you actually mentioned. Um, I would say that you know, an asset light approach to this business is, uh, has typically been the, the, you know, way to go and which is the Airbnb. I think you, with acquiring properties, you're talking more about the Sonder type model, which is more kind of, you know, managed and, and higher end and, and uh, um, more of a premium product. Uh, from my perspective, I, you know, we're, we're based here in the Middle East where cohabitation and co- and sharing houses and, and apartments was illegal, including till, till last year, uh, even in oh, Dubai. Wow. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was a personal status law, which I, I won't go into what those are, but but it required a, a change to that, which is very, very politically sensitive and will never happen in most other Arab countries. Um, but I, I would say from, from our lens that something uh, that might help you and be insightful to you is like there's a lot more of uh, competition I would say from geographies like ours for digital nomads and I think that's a phenomenal sort of sector to go after you know people who want to create this sort of uh, lifestyle now where they're hopping around different countries whether it's Dubai whether it's Bangkok it's Malaysia Singapore you know uh, Silicon Valley like that's a super interesting you're talking market. about the subscription model yeah, the global subscription I, model. Yeah, I think that's well, that, that's a lot bigger investment and requires a lot more legal work going into it because you're in so many different zones. You know what I mean? And marketing the same product and everybody has different residential real estate laws. So you're, it be, you know, until you scale up on a revenue, just the legal side of it is just mind blowing. If you're dealing with, you know, even in the states, you have 50 different states with 50 different residential laws. There's no federal you know, housing laws that govern real estate practices um, and property management. It's all done on a state level. So even here, we have to deal with 50 different governments. Yeah, for sure. That's why, uh, you know, Airbnb has one, one of the uh, best policy teams in, in the world, right? And they hire yeah. Yeah. former yeah. politicians oh, yeah, to run it. Because we're a, doing a little bit a longer and, term, though. You know, we're looking for more than one, two-year lease, college students, young professionals, um, you know, where they could potentially switch within our ecosystem as sort of a subscription model. Um, but, you know, it's not something, I don't know if I would advertise it as a rental subscription. I think that's uh, not quite it. I, I think all oh, my idea is more to equitize uh, their turn into housing owners by offering them incentives to continue using our real estate services when they go buy their first home and get their first mortgage. So maybe they get a $50 a month or hundred dollar a month credit towards their down payment or closing costs when they go to buy a house, when they leave seedlings. Joe, um, thank you. Um, thank you, Wes. Yash, do you have something to quick to add to Joe, please? Cause we need to wrap up. Here. I'll be super quick, right? Uh, Joe, love the enthusiasm. You're solving a two big problem. Pick your niche, focus on it. Graystar has the, is a gigantic billion dollar company doing exactly what you're doing. They closed down a division that was looking at this exact same sector. Understand what they did, understand where they failed, focus on figuring out how to change that. We Live went down this whole escapade about co-living. They did it in San Fran, found real estate was too expensive, couldn't turn junk real estate into co-living spaces that was cool. Something happened. I don't know. I don't know the detail. Figure out what that is. Solve that problem, right? 
what you're trying to do now is there's a wrong real estate value chain. You try to create value at each point. The problem is you're just like a, a lean team, right? You need to pick one area which you can sell and push to focus on, and then you can go down each vertical as you go, right? So if you want to start on, like say you mentioned acquiring a property, which is one whole baby on itself, managing the property, which is none on the whole baby, managing tenants, which is another whole baby, right? Then you are like, okay, loan origination, another whole thing, right? Pick one, focus there, find out what the problem points are, make that your initial sell story. And yes, you can expand up and down the value chain as where you see there's the biggest gaps, right? That's okay. If any of you guys need a link, I'll put a link to the pitch deck in here so you can take a look at it. Please do. Thank you, Joe. Thank, Thank you for you joining very us much. today. Thank you. Okay, so we had hoped we, we had higher expectations of going through more of the pitches for the night, but I think just to respect everyone's time, I would like to ask our mentors and our panelists to give advice. What would you say in one to two minutes from what you've heard and from what you've been experiencing, your, your experience expands just this session. So you've worked with founders before, people within the idea stage or even within the growth stage. One to two minutes of advice, general advice that you would give everyone working through their idea. Wiss, let's start with you, please. Um, I think, you know, the, the piece of advice I would give is like, it's an iterative process. And so, you know, accept our, our views as, as uh, what they are, opinions, and, and uh, we could be wrong. I mean, I, I, I you know, started investing thinking VCs had some sort of special power of predicting the future, which is, you know, absolutely 100% wrong. They don't know anything more than, than you would. Uh, in fact, probably, you know, your business far better than they do. Um, and so, you know, I would just say to, to uh, uh, you know, a, a accommodate and sort of just iterate through your deck with the comments that, that you hear and just keep on uh, improving. Um, I think one thing um, that that uh, struck me today is, is um, you know, if, if you don't mention competition out there when you're talking to investors and, and they sort of know it, you kind of lose uh, pretty much all credibility in, in, in terms of the pitch. And I think a lot of times those would end in, in investors not uh, pulling the trigger on, on your business. So it's really important to do do the uh, homework on, on comp uh, comp competition competitors. And that's yes. it for me. Thank you. So, so the awareness of the market is very important as well. So you, they know as investors or as collaborators that you know what you're talking about, not only that you know your business idea, but you know also what's out there and how you're differentiating yourself. Yash, what would be your advice? Um, so I have two, right? So one is generally, look, you're in a very constrained system when you're a founder. You don't have money, you don't have people, you don't have time, you don't have pitch, like uh, extent, focus on one problem which is your main sexiest problem that you want to solve and focus on actually cracking that right if you're trying to solve the whole ecosystem great but do that when you're airbnb and facebook right but until then solve one some of these niches are big enough to scale itself look at grammarly right it was a google plugin now it's four billion dollars right um second thing is on your stories that you need to sell to everyone right simply map out how it works, right? In the three pitches today, it didn't come across clearly what, how the parts put together like a jigsaw puzzle, right? Just do that. It's one page, it's worth it. It helps bring everyone into an understanding and even answer some of the questions like, this is how I'm competing, who I'm competing with, all of that, because people have seen models and they know who to compare it against, right? Yeah, that's it for me, thanks. Thank you. So again, it's about the clarity and it's about the vision, communicating the vision, but starting today, knowing where to start and now. Walid, what would be your advice? One of, one of the main advice is that um, uh, uh, founders should focus always on their niche and, and the challenges of the niche rather than focusing on the product. Because the product could be here today, tomorrow is not there. Uh, another thing I would ask them, most of the startups fail because of the founders, it's not because of the product. So the founder has to ask themselves several questions that 
Uh, would I be um, excited enough to work on this for the next six years or 10 years, perhaps? Because again, you, you need, uh, uh, Steve Blank said, a uh, uh, startup is an organization searching for a scalable and, and a reputable business model. In order to get to this point, you spend like two to three years sometime, sometime one to two years. And then when you find this scalable business model, then you start scaling. Then you need another couple of years, two, three years to scale. And then you look for exit. So the round uh, time, uh, it's about eight years. Uh, you need to look at things that are future proof. And uh, again, I will emphasize on what Yas and, uh, and, uh, and Wes said uh, about to avoid premature scaling, you know, focus on your own niche, focus on your own uh, uh, market, get it done properly, you know, have the cycle of acquisition, activation, retention, uh, referral, revenue, create this cycle many times, uh, then look for some other, uh, 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 some other markets or other geographies or other niches. So uh, you, you, you're doing really some good job instead of doing a mediocre job at, at a larger scale. Thank you, Walid. And that's very important as well, is knowing where to start, is, is focusing on what you need to do and making sure that you are as engaged in 10 years as you are today starting out. Thank you, uh, dear panelists, Wes, Walid, uh, Yashin, and of course, Carmen. Thank you so much for joining us, for all the value that you've added for the evening. Thank you, everyone who attended. Again, just reminding you, this is one opportunity. This is just was one pitch opportunity that you had within Founder Institute. You actually have 14 weeks and 14 opportunities to pitch and perfect that pitch. More importantly, you get to interact with mentors such as the, the gentleman that we had here with today who have the expertise, who have the experience and who have the exposure to be able to support you in refining your business idea, whether you're on the launch or at the growth stage. So please do not hesitate to check out fi.co slash apply slash GCC. Check out the program we're starting in June. And until then, we also have a, um, a lineup of other events. And we do have another pitching opportunity for those who have applied or enrolled within the program. And that's coming up early in June. Once again, thank you for joining us tonight or today, wherever you are in the world, we do have the AirMeet, a networking opportunity that we're gonna be around for at least 15 minutes over there. So please do join us and uh, we can keep the conversation running. Thank you, gentlemen. Good evening to you all. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.